Hi everyone, following on from last episode, let's go into the unit script and inside of the follow path coroutine, let's create a bool following path, which is initially true. And we can also create an int path index, which starts at zero. And we want to start with our unit facing the first look point in the path. So we can say transform.lookat path.lookpoints with an index of zero. Now, this while loop is going to run while we are following the path. So let's add that in there. And then inside the loop, we're going to want to constantly check if the unit has passed the next turn boundary. Now to do that, we're going to need a 2D version of our own position. So I'll create a vector two called pos2d equals new vector two with transform.position.x and transform.position.z as the coordinates. And then we can say if path.turn boundaries, the index of path index, if that has been crossed, so we use dot has crossed line with our 2D position as the argument, then if the path index is equal to path.finish line index, that means that we've actually finished the path. So we'll set following path equal to false. Otherwise, we simply want to increment the path index. So we say path index plus plus. All right, now every frame, provided we're still following the path, we're going to want to rotate the unit a little bit towards the look point and also move the unit forwards a little bit along the path. So let's create a quaternion target rotation, which we'll set equal to quaternion dot look rotation, which takes in a vector three for the direction in which we want to look. So that will be path dot look points path index minus our current position. We can then say transform dot rotation is equal to quaternion dot lerp from our current rotation towards the target rotation with a speed of time dot delta time times our turn speed, which is a variable we will create in just a moment. We then also want to move the unit forwards. So we can say transform dot translate vector three dot forwards multiplied by time dot delta time multiplied by our move speed. And then even though it's the default setting, let's just explicitly say that this is using space dot self. So it's moving relative to its own rotation. All right, very quickly, let's go up here and create a public float turn speed, set that equal to three by default. And we can then save and give this a try. So pressing play, we should see the unit smoothly following all of these waypoints. Now, one thing, if I quickly go into the seeker and set the speed very high, say 150, and I press play, you can see that the behavior is not quite perfect. Even if we turn the turn speed up uh, a lot, say to 50, it still leaves a lot to be desired, and that's because it's moving so fast that it's going past multiple turn boundaries in one frame. However, our code over here only handles updating the path index once per frame. So what we'll do is we'll change this if rather to a while. So it will keep looping until it's found the last uh, turn boundary that it crossed. Of course, since we're in a while loop now, we'll want to break out of it if the following path becomes false. So over here, we just write break. If we try this again now, we should see that it behaves far better. Now, it is worth mentioning that when you launch the game inside the Unity editor, the first few frames can have relatively large delta time values. And that means that right after hitting the play button, uh, the follow path accuracy will be a lot lower than it normally is. For example, say I press play, and then let me try it. pause this at the right moment. 
you can see the uh, unit has shot out all the way over here. However, if I press pause first and then play, and then after a moment unpause it, you can see that it uh, follows it much more accurately because it isn't having those first few frames with the abnormally large delta time values. So that's just something to obviously keep in mind if you're seeing any erratic behavior in the path following in the first few frames after launching the game. Let's now make it so that if the target position moves, the path automatically updates. So going into the unit script, we can have a coroutine. So I enumerator, call this update path. And we'll just have a while true loop in here. So every frame, let's say we request a new path from the path request manager. Now, of course, requesting a new path every single frame is not good for performance at all. So we could first of all say only update the path if the target has moved more than a certain threshold distance. So up at the top of the class somewhere, we can create a constant float called something like path update move threshold, let's say set that equal to 0.5 units. Then in the update path coroutine, as you're no doubt aware, comparing squared distances is faster than comparing uh, the actual distance, since uh, you can exclude the square root operation. So let's say float square move threshold is equal to the path update move threshold uh, squared. Then we're going to need to keep track of the target's previous position. So vector three target pos old is equal to target dot position. And then inside the loop, we can say if target dot position minus target position old dot square magnitude is greater than the square move threshold, then we're going to need to request a new path. Of course, at this moment, we'll need to update the target position old to the target's current position. Now, on top of this, we can also add a minimum amount of time that has to pass between each path request. So up here, let's create const float uh, min path update time, and say set this equal to 0.2 seconds. Then inside of the while loop, we can yield return new wait for seconds min path update time. Now, of course, when update path is first called, we want to request a new path regardless of whether the target has moved or not. So let's copy this and just request a new path right up at the top here. But to address the problem I was talking about earlier with uh, large delta time values at the start of the game, we can maybe say if time dot time since level load is less than some threshold, say uh, 0.3 seconds perhaps, then we're going to yield return new wait for seconds 0.3. Okay, let's bring our start method back. We can say start coroutine, update path. In Unity, let's now press play. And that's working nicely. Would like to bring these down to more reasonable values. So I'll set the speed to 20 and the turn speed to three. I also want to get my target out in the open here. So now when we press play, the unit is moving towards the target. And if we move this, then you can see the path updates so that the unit will follow it. All right, so that's all very nice. What I would like to do in the remainder of this episode is make it so that as the unit reaches the end of the path, it actually slows down and comes to a gradual halt. Now, in order to do this, we're going to need to be able to calculate how far the unit is from the finish line. So if we imagine this is our finish line, 
and this point is the unit's current position, then the closest point to the unit on the finish line is the point of intersection of the finish line with the perpendicular line from the unit's position. Now, we have the equation of our finish line in the form y equals mx plus c, and we can get the equation of the perpendicular line in that form as well. At the point of intersection, the y values of both equations will obviously be the same, so we can set the two equations to be equal to one another. Thus we get m1 times x plus c1 is equal to m2 times x plus c2. We can easily rearrange this to solve for x, and of course by feeding x back into the equation for either one of the two lines, we can get the y value as well of the point of intersection. So now the problem is as simple as finding the distance between two points. All right, now to actually code this, let's go into the line script and I'll create a public method returning a float called something like distance from point, taking in a vector two for our point. We have already calculated the gradient and y-intercept of the line itself, and we know the gradient of the perpendicular line, so we just need to find the y-intercept of the line uh, through point P. So we've seen how to do this before over here. We just take point dot y minus gradient times the point dot x. So let's write float y intercept perpendicular is equal to p dot y minus the gradient, which is, in this case is gradient perpendicular, multiplied by p dot x. Then the x coordinate of the point of intersection, so I'll call this intersect x, is equal to, as we saw, the y intercept of our second line minus the y intercept of our first line, divided by the gradient of our first line minus the gradient of the second line. The point of intersection on the y-axis is then simply gradient multiplied by intersect x plus the y-intercept. All right, so now we can return vector two dot distance between the given point and a new vector two at intersect x and intersect y. Let's save this and go into our unit script. In here, I'm then going to make a public float stopping distance, which is just how far from the finish line the unit starts slowing down. So I'll maybe set this equal to 10. Then in the follow path coroutine, we'll create a float speed percent, which I'll set to one. And if we're following a path, then we want to say speed percent is equal to the distance from the finish line. So that would be path dot turn boundaries with an index of finish line index dot distance uh, from our position 2D. So this distance divided by the stopping distance, we'll also want to clamp this between 0 and 1 with mathf dot clamp 01. And now we've got a value speed percent that is 1 when the distance from the finish line exceeds the stopping distance and moves towards 0 as the unit gets closer and closer to the finish line. So when we are doing our translation, we will multiply the speed by the speed percent. Now, there's one potential problem with this implementation. So we've got a path that starts somewhere over here and goes around some obstacle and ends up maybe over here. Now, in this case, our finish line going through the end point will be something like this. The obvious problem here is that the unit will start slowing down somewhere over here since it's close to the finish line, despite not being anywhere near to the end of the path. I'll now fill in in blue where the look points for this path might be. To solve the problem, we'll work backwards from the end point, summing the distances between each point until the total distance exceeds the stopping distance. 
we'll then record the index of that point as the slowdown index and only start slowing the unit down once it has passed that point. So let's go into our path class and add an additional parameter to the constructor, float stopping distance, and we'll also add a new public read-only int, that being the slowdown index. Then at the bottom of the constructor here, we can have a float distance from endpoint, which starts at zero, and then we'll loop for int i equal to look points dot length minus one, while i is greater than zero, i minus minus. We can say distance from endpoint gets increased by vector three dot distance between look points with an index of i and the previous look point, so look points with an index of i minus one. Now, if the distance from the endpoint is greater than the stopping distance, then we'll say slowdown index is equal to i, and we will break out of the loop. Let's save this and go into the unit. And in here we'll say that we're only going to bother slowing down if the path index is greater than or equal to path dot slowdown index, and also if the stopping distance is greater than zero. All right. Now, as speed percent becomes very, very low, it's going to take a long time to traverse the last tiny bit of distance uh, to the finish line. So what's probably a good idea is to say that if the speed percent becomes lower than some threshold, I'll say 0 0.01, then we're just going to cut off the path right there by saying following path is now equal to false. We must also remember to go up here to where we're creating a new path and pass in this additional stopping distance argument. All right, let's save this and go into Unity. And here we can try it out. So as the unit gets close, we should hopefully see it slowing down. And it does. Let's just try this with a slightly higher speed and maybe a greater stopping distance. And hopefully it will still work just as well. Very nice. And if we move the target around, it still continues to work. All right, so that is everything for this episode. Until next time, cheers.